Greetings, everybody. It's, uh, I'm delighted for this session, uh, an interview with uh, one of the chairs of the ESH guidelines, Professor Giuseppe Mancia, and our, our ISH president, uh, Professor Brian Williams. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anastasia Mahaladu. I'm the current chair of the communications committee for ISH, and um, I'm going to go round round uh, for introductions. Professor Mancia, first of all, seeing it's the SH guidelines. This time we decided to have uh, guidelines uh, uh, just by the European Society of Hypertension, not together with the European Society of Cardiology. I'm not going to go into details, but this was uh, necessary on the side of the European Society of Hypertension. And we had, uh, you know, the, the, the way we did it was the usual one, uh, this time a little bit more uh, um, interactive. Uh, each member of the task force uh, had to uh, write a section or there were groups of people writing sections. And this was reviewed by a small uh, steering committee with interaction back and forth. And in the end, we had uh, this uh, very comprehensive document, uh, 22 sections, uh, 190 pages, uh, 1800 uh, 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 references. And we hope uh, that this uh, guidelines will be uh, appreciated uh, not only by the practicing physician, but also by hypertension experts uh, and even hypertension investigators, because uh, they do go into controversial issues and try to, uh, I mean, take a position about uh, non-univocal evidence, which is, as a matter of fact, is, uh, is quite common in the hypertension area. But we will see, of course. Thank you. Professor Williams. Yes. Um, so I'm Brian Williams. I'm chair uh, president of the ISH, and I was um, a member of the guideline task force. Thank you. Swapnil. Hey, I'm Swapnil Hiremat. I'm a nephrologist, uh, an epidemiologist. I'm an associate professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada. I'm here as part of the ISH communications committee. Thank you. So we might start with the questions. And um, uh, first of all, I'll, uh, given that you're the uh, co-chair, Professor Mancia, um, I'd like to commend you, uh, uh, your co-chair, Professor Krutz, and your task force for collating such a uh, comprehensive document, 22 sections, my goodness, uh, and 150 pages, a lot of the references you highlighted. Um, if we go into the SH um, website, and it was mentioned at the, the presentations, which is wonderful, the new guidelines are designed to, to serve as an essential resource for healthcare professionals across the world. Could you elaborate on how the guidelines you hope will be uh, relate to other national guidelines, including the NICE guidelines? And we didn't have any contact with uh, healthcare authorities, uh, neither in the past, not today, because they have expressed always a limited interest in guidelines issued by the national societies. But we did have uh, continuous contacts uh, with the uh, national hypertension societies, because in the past, uh, from most countries, uh, these guidelines have been accepted uh, with, uh, of course, uh, some changes uh, because of the local conditions uh, and uh, translated into local languages. So also this time we did have contact with uh, residents of national societies and uh, included them uh, as reviewers uh, or even members of the task force. Thank you. Professor Williams, it, it's interesting that this year the ESH guidelines have included it in the title endorsement by the International Society of Hypertension and also the European uh, Renal Society. Uh, could you elaborate on what the endorsement means and how it relates to the ISH guidelines, please? Yeah, this is, um, I think, quite an important uh, development. And actually, I think it reflects the fact that the European Society of Hypertension, the International Society of Hypertension, have, a, have had a long-standing, very strong relationship. And I, it's probably as good now as it's ever been. Um, and when the ESH decided that they would uh, 
um, develop a new guideline. And we had discussions around involvement in the guideline development process. We felt it was important that we showed support for the ESH guideline from the ISH and therefore uh, formally endorsed the development of the ESH guideline. And there were at least um, uh, two or three members of the ISH leadership that were part of the task force that developed um, the guideline, if not more, actually. So I think I think it, it just reflects a very strong and long-standing relationship between the two societies. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so again, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, so I want to ask Professor Mancia about the timelines. Uh, so we saw the you know, this is the 2023, we saw we had previous guidelines in 2018 and 2013 before that. Is the plan to have these uh, updated at, you know, regular five-year intervals or is it like, you know, we have a huge dump of evidence and now we do need to update the guidelines. How does the thought process works uh, for this? Well, of course, uh, guidelines are influenced by the generation of new data. In the past, starting from two or three, guidelines have been issued every five years, uh, 207, 213, uh, 218, and now 223. Um, so uh, in the future, I think it will be the same. I think uh, there should not be too, I mean, the interval should not be too restricted. For example, Canadian guidelines are used to have, uh, you know, update of the guidelines every six months or every year. So I think this is probably too short because uh, you have to metabolize new evidence. Uh, sometimes even uh, studies which seem to be simple to be interpreted, like trials, A versus B, it's A, B versus C. I think you have a second, third, the fourth line of reading uh, the the publications. So uh, too frequent guidelines uh, uh, are not uh, an optimal decision, in my opinion. But even uh, uh, too rarefied guidelines are not good because uh, what is important is not only elements of novelties but confirmation. Because I mean, confirmation means uh, that uh, the old evidence is still valid. Uh, and uh, is standing uh, the test of time. And I think this is probably not less important uh, than novelties. For Fantastic. example, uh, this year, there was a, a confirmation of the 218 guidelines, and this was combination treatment at the very beginning. And the same was for the ISH guidelines in 2020. Now, it's not novel, but to me, it seems extremely important. Yeah, yeah, true. I, I, I love the we need to metabolize new evidence uh, <laughs> phrase. It, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and you're right, the Canadian guidelines, which I'm a part of, we have put them on a pause. The once a year was too much. I don't think that could be carried out. Uh, but, you know, moving on to the ISH guidelines, uh, Professor Williams, uh, the ISH came out with the first, you know, uh, uh, global hypertension practice guidelines in 2020. Uh, there were, it was a very useful set of documents, of course, you know, especially with the uh, looking at the global perspective, because it's not a one size fits all uh, evidence base. Uh, is there any plan on updating the ISH uh, guidelines? Uh, not at the moment, but maybe I'll first guess, uh, uh, build on what uh, Giuseppe said, which I think is really important that, um, you know, there tends to be a sort of five year cycle for renewal of guidelines. And that reflects the fact that you would expect within a five year period new evidence to have emerged in some areas, not in all areas. And actually, I think one of the really important things about the new European guidelines and the SH is that quite a lot of the areas that we discussed, and Giuseppe and I worked on the guideline in 2018 for Europe, um, we discussed then, still remain the same now. And that's important because it shows you that the evidence is being consolidated it's been reaffirmed, um, and I suspect we're going to see less and less changes over the next 10, 15, 20 years of guideline development, simply because I think we're reaching a point that we can't go much further on thresholds and targets uh, 
um, where, you know, um, we've got very good treatments and we've just got to see them better implemented. So I think the the reinforcement of a lot of the messages in the new guideline is, is, is particularly important. With regard to the ice age, we haven't discussed updating the 2020 guideline because, of course, that's still within a three-year time period. Um, and the guideline from the ice age, I think last time, under some prompting from ourselves, has shifted more towards saying, well, what's needed? We just don't need a rehash of what's happening everywhere else in the world. And instead, it's slightly more focused on uh, low and middle income countries and uh, contrasting what you might call optimal care, which may not be deliverable in all parts of the world because of the economic situation with, with an essential standard of care. In other words, well, if you can't deliver optimal, at least try and do this. And uh, so I thought that was a, an important um, uh, development for the ISH, and I hope it's one that will continue in the next iteration of the ISH guideline. But at the moment, I don't think there's any need to change what the ISH has written previously. And as I say, it's only within the last three years. Yeah, the essential and optimal care was a wonderful part of the ISH documents, indeed. Professor Mancia, if you had to pick uh, a few key top line messages from the 2023 update, which ones would you pick and why? Oh, well, let me say that I think there are several elements of novelties in the guideline, and they will appear as soon as people, you know, will read them. Just, for example, on the diagnostic side, uh, uh, upgrading of the out-of-office blood pressure use. Uh, based uh, not on new evidence, because unfortunately, there is a big problem that there are no randomized outcome-based trials for uh, out-of-office blood pressure. But I think everybody in the task force agreed that uh, there, are so, uh, there are so many information provided by this approach that uh, we, could, we should recommend them and say, do it whenever it is possible. So this was the formula. But even new risk factors... Uh, have emerged uh, and uh, organ damage. There are some important elements of novelties, particularly the relationship between difference between changes in organ damage by treatment and uh, and patients' outcome. And then threshold and target, they look the same of the previous guidelines, but in fact, in some subgroups, they are different from what is recommended in the majority of hypertensive patients. Beta blockers have been upgraded. Uh, and new drugs have been discussed at length, the SGLT2 and phenerenon for resistant hypertension, but also for other conditions. Renal denervation has been now recommended as an option, not uh, no more than this. And the treatment, for example, of special conditions such as heart failure and chronic kidney disease is quite different from previous uh, guidelines. And then a lot of conditions not dealt with in the past. For example, blood pressure, different blood pressure phenotypes. And this has been devoted quite, uh, uh, quite a space by, by the European uh, guidelines. So just, uh, I think, uh, uh, not only the confirmations, but also the novelties are uh, quite a few. Thank you. I like the fact that there's a dedicated section for uh, hypertension in women, and it's exactly. stated there yeah. that that um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is probably the preferred method, which is what we're finding in, in the clinics because of the white coats. So thank you. Um, Professor Williams, could you remind our viewers, because it'll be across the ESH and ISH, uh, the key top messages from our 2020-ish guidelines? Yeah, I think <clears throat> in many ways, um, a lot of complementarity with what um, Giuseppe has just said. But I think because the ISH guidelines were were focused more on um, essential standards of care, with the optimal standards were pretty much the same, as we've seen in the recent European guidelines, uh, the essential standards of care were really saying, well, um, if you can't deliver optimal, at least try and achieve uh, blood pressure below 150 systolic, if you can. And, and the reason for that was to say that actually a lot of the benefit of blood pressure lowering comes from 
the lowering of blood pressure from very high levels down to sort of below 150, then down to below 140. And as you go down and down and down in the optimal guideline, you get to some extent less and less return because obviously you're reducing risk um, as you lower pressure. So in page, people who are untreated in some parts of the world with very high blood pressures, there is an enormous amount to be gained, even by achieving what we described as the sort of essential standards of care. And in the same way with drug therapy, we said obviously drug therapy is generally based around a combination of a RAS blocker with a CCB or diuretic predominantly. However, you know, in, in other parts of the world, if such treatments aren't available, then any type of treatment that is going to reduce blood pressure is going to produce benefits. So, so continue to use other forms of treatment, even if they're not regarded as sort of the optimal combinations of therapy that we would uh, look at at the moment. And then the final issue was emphasizing the importance of lifestyle interventions, particularly in the developing world, because these can be done free. And we know that, for example, salt intake in particular in some parts of the world where there is um, low uh, to middle income, um, salt intake can be a massive problem. I mean, huge amounts of salt in the diet in some countries contributing to the problem of hypertension. So I think they were the key messages for me. Uh, the thing that differentiated the I stage guideline from all other guidelines in the world, emphasizing the enormous opportunity by doing, you know, almost the bare minimum in terms of achieving certain levels of control and using whatever drugs you've got available and not forgetting the importance of lifestyle. Um, I, if I, can, I, agree if I can add a comment to what yes. Brian said, I think uh, the European guidelines, the 223 European guidelines reflect uh, what was the position of the ISH guidelines uh, from, from another perspective. That is, for example, target blood pressure, two levels of evidence. One was a must, mm. uh, less than 140, but uh, in people with ISH, for example, or uh, above 80 years of age, it was uh, 150. And then if treatment is well tolerated, uh, yeah. try to go lower. Uh, so so the, the, I think this is, uh, reflects a more conservative attitude by these two guidelines compared to several other guidelines. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, And I, and I would agree, we, we just be, I think we'd all agree that a lot of the benefit is gained getting below 150 and then going below exactly, 140. Exactly. And you're getting marginal gains going lower and actually an increased risk of adverse effects as well. Yes. Yeah. I liked the the emphasis on age because we're the biggest uh, growing demographic is the aged, and and there is a real problem in treating hypertension in those individuals. Thank you. Yeah, and that segues very nicely into you know the process question that I have for Professor Mancia. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the process? You know, you talked about how the evidence has to be metabolized and and ratified. Um, so how is the evidence, uh, you know, for us to get a peek for the readers and uh, viewers about uh, about the process? How is the evidence reviewed and, uh, yes, and graded? There, was, uh, there were some changes uh, in, the, in the way the level was uh, assessed. Uh, one change was to abolish the A and B in the two class of evidence, uh, because we thought that this, uh, first of all, is quite controversial. Uh, I remember also in the past, I mean, the people, um, I mean, frequently disagree about whether it should be 2A or 2B. So we thought it doesn't add much. And so we just had uh, simplification. It was uh, um, uh, class of evidence one and class of evidence two. One is undisputable about the benefit and two is more controversial. The data cannot be univocal and things like this. Uh, this was uh, one thing. And then uh, we had uh, a, an assessment also of the risk of bias uh, and the quality of the information provided. And so data were, according to the grade uh, approach, uh, uh, we also assessed this. Uh, and, and this was uh, something new, which uh, had not been done uh, at the same level in previous guidelines. Uh, so these were the main the two main uh, elements of novelties in the assessment uh, of evidence. Then the, uh, the remaining prob prob 
process was similar. We had uh, uh, back and forth uh, comments, uh, disagreement, uh, finally agreement. Uh, uh, we had this reviewed by about 60 reviewers, not only from Europe, but also from uh, extra European uh, countries. Uh, and we uh, did not want to have uh, voting in case of disagreement, because we think that voting has little to do with the a scientific process in a way. So we always search for a consensus on each issue. Brilliant. Uh, so, you know, Professor Williams, you have been on the uh, ESH uh, guideline writing group as well as on the ISH. You know, what did you find? Uh, what were the similarities? What were the differences? Any Anything you could share with the viewers? Well, I mean, apart from the, the specifics like grading and what have you, I don't think there are a huge amount of differences about the way the ISH and the ESH approached guideline development. I think there are differences emerging in other parts of the world. Um, and I don't know whether one process or the other is the best. I mean, what I mean is if you look at some guideline development processes now, it's becoming very technical. So people are, for example, saying that you need to use a sort of set out your defined questions, restrict the number of defined questions, maybe just to maybe six or seven questions that you're going to address as a guideline committee, and then send somebody off to do an independent systematic review focused just on those questions. And what tends to come back is a very technical document, which is, you know, uh, I guess, scientifically correct, but is a real problem and it doesn't always address all of the questions that physicians might have when dealing with individual patients. So you've got this sort of tension and I mean, Giuseppe will have seen this as well with, you know, we often have debates with other guideline development groups that want to go down this, what might be considered a more scientifically pure approach, but ends up coming out with loads of areas where there are no recommendations at all. In other words, it hasn't been possible to find evidence or it hasn't been possible to make a concrete recommendation. That isn't helpful because at the end of the day, a lot of the doctors that treat hypertension are not specialists. They're not reading the literature like we do on a regular basis. They're not having the kind of scientific dialogue and exchange that specialists in the area will be having. And therefore, they do rely on expertise and consensus in terms of helping them guide their practice. After all, you know, they ask a question, how do you do this? They, they will ask a group of people who've read the literature, formed an opinion about the best way to do it. And they'll probably trust that more than just uh, a guideline that will say, well, we don't know what the real answer is because the evidence hasn't been fully evaluated in this particular round of guideline development. So... So I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in the guideline development space and a sense that, you know, unless you do it in the scientifically pure way and do independent systematic reviews, it's not a formal guideline. Well, I would argue that most of the time those systematic reviews come up with the same answers that is already published in the literature with meta-analysis and other reviews that's already out there. And at the end of the day, even where the evidence is limited, uh, clinicians on the ground still respect and appreciate expert opinion and consensus when there's no other evidence available. And I think we should re respect that and actually continue to provide it. I don't know what you think, Giuseppe, but there yeah, is- Yes, I, said, no. I fully agree. I think, for example, of a crucial aspect of in the management of hypertension, which is follow-up. I mean, what? evidence, <clears throat> how many visits should be done, uh, many, many other things. And now it has, uh, it should include adherence, you know, measure, how to measure non-adherence uh, in clinical inertia, several other models of following patients. Uh, and if we had to really say something only based on evidence, we wouldn't be able to say anything. Yeah. The, uh, experts uh, and uh, expert opinions are needed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, it fits nicely to the next question, Professor Mancia. One of the questions with any guidelines is whether the recommendations are practical. Do you consider the ESH guidelines practical to implement? Do they need to be practical or can they be aspirational? Well, 
if I'm not too ambitious, I, I would say both purposes. <laughs> I mean, because, uh, uh, I mean, guidelines has to be aspirational in a way. They should aim uh, at improving clinical practice. I mean, if they just reflect clini clinical practice, uh, even when clinical practice is bad, I mean, it, uh, it wouldn't work, I think. So, uh, and they should also be educational uh, because, um, first of all, evidence, uh, clear evidence covers only a fraction of the recommendations, not a majority fraction, a minority fraction. Uh, and this means uh, that uh, the reason for a given recommendation should be, in a way, known uh, by the physicians. We cannot just give orders and say, do that without explaining why. And in many cases, it's not so simple because of the non-univocal evidence. Uh, of course, it has to be practical, but like uh, previous guidelines did, uh, I think this is now a rather common format, uh, uh, at the end of each section, we had the usual short list of simple recommendations, uh, and uh, which uh, could serve the purpose of being practical, uh, unless uh, physicians are scared by by the, the you know the size of the guidelines. But if they are not, uh, they can go to these simple recommendations and maybe go to the text whenever something is not clear or they disagree on something. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, the we talked about aspirational and practical, uh, but the, the question then that leads to Professor Mancia is about the implementation. So is there a plan uh, to measure the success of implementation of the uh, ESH guidelines? Well, implementation is, pain, is a painful issue. Exactly. Personally, I think that uh, guidelines is useful they change clinical practice, but over the long term. If we look uh, at uh, how practice was uh, 50 years ago when guidelines started, first in the state, and then the WHO together with the ISH, well, I think that practice has changed along the line of the guidelines. But if, if we think that the guidelines have a, a quick effect, I mean, in, in, in a matter of two, three or four years, well, I'm afraid that, that uh, uh, this is difficult to be proven. And there are some areas in which uh, uh, it seems that uh, implementation is particularly slow. For example, guidelines strongly recommended uh, combination treatment, first combination treatment up to titration, but recently only initial combination treatment. I, I would think all major guidelines are doing this. Uh, well, in a recent study from the Lombardy database in Italy, more than 10 million people, uh, Lombardy is the region where I live. Well, two thirds of the patients after three years of follow-up were still on uh, monotherapy. Hmm. Contrary to all, <laughs> all guidelines recommendation. So again, uh, I think we should look at the long-term effects. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Professor Williams, bouncing the same question to you. You know, the e ISH guidelines came out in 2020. Mm. Um, has there been any uh, measurement or implementation? A tough, tough question again. Well, I think that, I mean, I, as Giuseppe said, I mean, guidelines really set the framework for practice. They, they're serving a purpose in generating a sort of consensus around what we should be doing. Independently, guidelines have very little power to influence practice beyond making those recommendations, because of, often this is down to individual countries and individual governments and how they approach prevention and uh, cardiovascular disease prevention, and specifically. Um, so, so it's. But I, I do think that we need to recognise that there is, a, you know, guidelines are limited, and that we need to have a stronger focus on implementation as we go forward and and there is an, an emerging and growing area of implementation science the ways in which you can influence policy the way in which you can influence individual behavior etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's probably quite a lot to be gained and um, from trying to learn about how you know advertising agencies and various other people influence people's behaviors and uh, and therefore influence 
uh, preventive health measures. We haven't done enough of that, whether that's the job of guidelines or whether that's the job of some other process that we can try and influence, I think is is open to debate. But I share the frustration that Giuseppe um, alluded to, that if you look at the, you know, the rates of detection, treatment and control of blood pressure across the world over the last 20 years, when we've had a lot of guidelines, um, there have been trends to improvements in some countries, particularly some of the developed nations, um, but they've been nowhere near fast enough. And it's still very, very depressing. Even if you look at the most developed countries with ready access to care, you know, the, the numbers of patients who are detected, treated and controlled, it will, will be way less than 30% in most countries in the world. So, and if you go to some of the developed nations, uh, underdeveloped or low middle income countries um, in the world, you know, you're going to see less than 10% of people living in those regions of the world that have their blood pressure detected, treated and controlled. So, so, so still a lot of work to do around how we implement and influence uh, policy around this hugely effective treatment. Indeed. Thank you. Professor Mancia, a, a notable change in the uh, from the 2018 guidelines was, as most are saying, buzzing around the uh, when they were introduced, the introduction of the beta blockers are back. Um, there is concern amongst colleagues that beta blockers are recommended for patients with HEFPEF. Could you advise how the task force reached this recommendation and your view? Well, uh, the, the reason for this was, first of all, that uh, there are very few randomized clinical trials on uh, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, the second one is no trial really provides clear evidence uh, of superiority of one drug class compared to the others. I'm talking about the classical antihypertensive drugs, of course. And so the conclusion was that uh, we shouldn't change uh, uh, what was the general type of treatment. That is, the five major drug classes can be do to, I mean, prevent uh, heart failure because each uh, drug class has evidence of uh, ability to prevent uh, uh, heart failure. In fact, this is uh, one of the clearest uh, uh, protective effect uh, of antihypertensive treatment. And this includes uh, beta blockers. Among these, uh, this preventive effect, of course, there must be prevention also of uh, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because uh, this covers uh, uh, about 50% of all heart uh, failures. This was basically the reason why uh, there was uh, it, it was felt that there was no need really to privilege some drug classes compared to another. Of course, the addition to this was uh, a recommendation to use uh, SGLT2 uh, drugs uh, and RNA because of the marginal evidence and some beneficial effect uh, and uh, spironolactone, which was given, of course, uh, uh, which was included uh, in the description of the drugs that can be used. One other consideration was uh, that um, uh, several people pointed out that the, the field is moving to a progressive reduction in the differentiation between heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction, because it looks like really uh, uh, People with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, they do have uh, uh, some reduction in ejection fraction. This is not normal. And conversely, people with uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction, they have obviously diastolic dysfunction. So probably in the future, this differentiation will be less and less used. And in the end, we may have a unification of the two types of heart failure, which is an argument in favor of unification of treatment as well. I, I would agree with that, Giuseppe. I mean, I think, you know, basically the, the definition of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was really a way of reminding people that you could be in heart failure 
even if your ejection fraction looked to be in the normal limits and it reflected stiff ventricle. And I think in many cases it reflects hypertensive heart disease. I mean, I think that's probably what most of hypertension with preserved ejection fraction is. But um, but I agree. I think there's going to be some sort of uh, emerging and alignment of treatment across that spectrum. Uh, Professor Williams, um, uh, obviously um, the SGLT2 inhibitors weren't around in 2020, but um, the, the ISH guidelines don't recommend beta blockers or what most would say should be put into the water, the SGLT2 <laughs> inhibitors. How should clinicians and health professionals manage their patients with hypertension given these new agents? Well, I don't think that's true to say that the ISH guidelines in 2020 didn't recommend beta blockers. I think they they did the same kind of recommendation that was in the 2018 European guidelines, which was that beta blockers could be used at any stage of the treatment strategy uh, if there was a guideline directed indication to use them. Um, so in other words, they could be used first line for example, in patients post-MI, patients with heart failure, patients with symptomatic angina, that often gets misrepresented as not recommending, but actually it was clear that they were potentially usable at any stage. The other thing that actually in many ways elevated beta blockers in the context of the ISH guideline was the, the essential uh, treatment, which said if you couldn't follow the treatment strategy as outlined in the so-called optimal treatment strategy algorithm, which may have not involved beta blockers because there wasn't a guideline directed indication for that particular patient, you could still use beta blockers as part of the essential therapy as well, because we said any drug that has evidence of lowering blood pressure or reducing outcomes in particular could be used in patients um, as part of the essential treatment strategy. So I think beta blockers certainly did feature, but they, you know, obviously they, 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 they've been presented as having been relegated in that guideline, but I don't necessarily always agree with that. The second issue, as you say, is SGLT2 inhibitors weren't around at the time. They're still not licensed formally for the treatment of hypertension even today. So they would have to be used in an off-license indication uh, my own personal view is that they work predominantly as a naturetic agent, diuretic naturetic agent, and therefore, to some extent, that explains their benefits in heart failure and potentially in kidney disease as well. And, and I think they will turn out to be used more commonly in the future uh, as a complementary strategy to, to enable blood pressure control, particularly in patients where blood pressure control is difficult and not completely achieved with the standard recommended therapies. And then on top of that, SGLT2 inhibitors will be given anyway to patients with chronic kidney disease and patients with heart failure because of their proven benefits in those kind of scenarios. So we're definitely going to see more of them in, in hypertensive if patients. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with the positioning of them in the 2023 European Society of Hypertension Guidelines. Thank Excellent. you. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, you know, SGLT2 inhibitors of Flozins do have, will probably have an indication otherwise in most of our patients. Yeah. Uh, For the beta yeah. blockers, if I can, the specific conditions are quite a few. I mean, with some colleagues, we wrote a paper and identified uh, more than, uh, apart from the classical indications, uh, of course, postmycardial infarction, heart failure, and so forth between 40 and 50 conditions in which uh, beta blockers uh, are, usual, are used in clinical practice. In fact, one of the sentences in the guidelines uh, says, if I remember correctly, that this makes beta blockers a de facto <laughs> uh, first step treatment of hypertension. Indeed. Uh, so along the along the lines of what you're saying, you know, what are the, um, uh, and the implementation aspect is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the task force is doing now, now that the guidelines have been published, uh, you know, in terms of outreach and, and making sure people are going to use those guidelines, like, like you are appearing on our uh, show, uh, Professor Mancia? Well, first of, uh, first of all, what we are doing now, Professor Kreutz and myself are just resting, you know. Because uh, it was quite uh, 
quite an effort, uh, also for small details. I mean, uh, the the the, uh, the substance was given by task force members, but uh, uh, harmonizing, you know, the different contributions was was uh, was not uh, not an easy task. Guidelines will be published in the Journal of Hypertension in the August issue. They will also be published um, by the European Journal of Internal Medicine. And I thought this was a good thing because hypertension does not belong to cardiologists only. I mean, hypertension is uh, much more than cardiology. Cardiology, of course, is a very important component, but uh, they are nephrologists, they are internists, they are geriatricians. Uh, and uh, one of the purposes of these, gui- uh, of, the, of these guidelines, European guidelines, was to reposition hypertension in the center of medicine because this is where it deserves to be. Thank you. So on uh, on um, a, a specific I- I issue, which is close to my heart in terms of ambulatory blood pressure measurement, the intervals, um, I think it was posted in one of the, the presentations for nighttime or sleep time is 20 minutes. Um, could you advise what is the evidence for this recommendation, given that patients complain that even 30 minute intervals are disruptive to their sleep? At least my patients do. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, uh, it in, it's interesting how a, a marginal note in the guidelines became became an issue or a widely discussed <laughs> issue. But uh, I think I can tell you that uh, we several people uh, in the task force uh, found it paradoxical that the most important prognostic. Uh, uh, factor within the 24 hours, I mean, nighttime blood pressure is measured uh, less frequently, once an hour, one measurement per hour, which means that uh, if this is artifactual, you miss the hour. And this happens very many times. Uh, Many papers do not tell you uh, on how many measurements uh, nighttime blood pressure values uh, are obtained. And um, and uh, so there is the possibility that if you rarify the frequency of measurements during the night, we may really lose in terms of quality the advantage uh, uh, about uh, uh, outcome prediction, uh, which is attributed uh, and rightly so to nighttime blood pressure. But I think there is more more evidence than this, uh, except that evidence uh, is a sort of a paleolithic evidence because it goes back to 1983. At the time we were doing intraarterial blood pressure monitoring and so had eat bit to bit data. And what we did in one of the studies, which was published on hypertension, was to mimic uh, intermittency. That is, we calculated the mean based on all values. And then we recalculated the mean, taking one value every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes, Mm -hmm. up to 60 minutes. When we had only one value every 60 minutes, the average could be far away from the true average, which was calculated by all values, you see. So, I mean, uh, exaggerating in the interval between uh, measurements can give us uh, poor quality data. This was even more the case for calculation of uh, variability, but it was the case also for calculation of uh, mean values. Uh, clearly, uh, if uh, the interval between measurement was uh, 60 minutes. Now, the final point is that we did uh, have uh, in the Pamela study, which is a population study still running in the Nordic Stadskart of Milan, we had uh, equal measurements during the day and night, 20 minutes, 20 uh, intervals of 20 minutes, and we didn't have any problem. We had very nice reduction in blood pressure in the whole population in different subgroups. Uh, and so it didn't look that uh, having one more value per hour uh, really destroyed uh, uh, the the ability of uh, patients to lower blood pressure at night. 
I think that you know some patients certainly cannot uh, stand the uh, uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring during the night. But I think that they, if they do, uh, it is not because they have two or three measurements rather than one. I think it's just because they don't 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 like the, the procedure. Yes, thank you. Professor Williams, uh, we have the recommendation in the 2020-ish guidelines for 24 hour monitoring 15 to 30 minute intervals during daytime and nighttime. Could you elaborate on what the evidence used for the recommendation? Well, I, mean, I think that reflects to some extent what Giuseppe just said. I mean, if there's no, there is no absolute definitive data that says it must be this interval or must be that interval. And I think we were basically saying these are the sort of intervals that have been used in the past um, in terms of uh, achieving uh, those measurements. Having said all that, I, I don't anticipate in the developing parts of the world and in the low middle income countries that ABPM will be used very often. Yeah. When I travel uh, more often than not, um, it's, it's home blood pressure monitoring, which is becoming more commonly used uh, to measure blood pressure at home. And most of the time that won't involve nighttime readings, although some devices are now being developed that can be adapted to measure blood pressure at night, but probably not as frequently as every 20 minutes. So, so I think this is a moving target at the moment, and uh, we're probably going to see a lot more technology developed to enable us to measure night blood, nighttime blood pressure less obtrusively um, in the future. But it's quite intriguing, and as, as Giuseppe mentioned, that it's quite often these small issues within guidelines that capture lots of attention, particularly for some of the enthusiasts. But I think the most important message is, is let's first of all, try and get most people around the world to get their blood pressures measured. I mean, <laughs> that, that's still a big problem. I think uh, um, Brian, uh, in line on what you are saying, for example, the, the, uh, the, uh, there could be in the future uh, cuffless um, yeah. Sure. measuring devices which could really uh, remove at least in part the, the disadvantage of measuring blood. very much so the patients are coming in with them and want them so i think we need to somehow see that um uh, just, on that point, um, just on that point anastasia though and i think it was i was pleased to see it in the uh european Society of hypertension guideline patients are coming in with these things and buying them but none of them have been properly validated. And, uh, you know, I think it was a good recommendation at the moment not to use cuffless devices as a standard yeah. uh, for blood pressure measurement. We need a lot more information about In the future. How these things are. Yeah, I was going to say that they're not quite validated yet, no, but no, that no. shouldn't limit our, 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 uh, our desire because it will eliminate all of these questions. On that note, and it's been a delight to have everybody here, Professor Mancia, last words in terms of for people who are uh, looking at the guidelines and thinking, uh, how do I read it all and, and uh, you know, how it will impact my practice. Do you want to have a few words? Yes, <laughs> I hope that uh, it will be well accepted and uh, also followed, although we know that uh, uh, we've talked about, you know, the difficult implementation of guidelines, but I hope, and uh, particularly that we we'll look at the, the chapter and sections which have never been dealt with that, that could give a link between hypertension and other conditions, never mentioned, for example, inflammatory diseases, uh, um, uh, and uh, and uh, and other conditions, sex differences you mentioned, but also, for example, one other condition, interesting condition, was uh, to have the essential information of uh, blood pressure elevation in children in the transition phase, yeah. which is a particularly difficult phase, and some other things which I think important. But also in two eighteen, we had this, uh, and this is uh, a final table with uh, gaps in evidence. Uh, because guidelines should help uh, covering gaps in evidence. Uh, and this is the appropriate uh, role uh, guidelines have. Yes. Professor Williams, your closing remarks? Well, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think for me, um, the thing that came across reading the latest document and uh, contributing to it, but reading the final version is just how much 
evidence there is and how much information there is about the treatment of hypertension, which makes it even more frustrating that so little attention is paid in sort of policy around the world in terms of ensuring that people have access to ways to measure their blood pressure and know what their blood pressure is um, as an important number and, and also get access to treatments which we know are hugely effective um, at reducing death and also promoting healthy life expectancy and, and finally getting blood pressure controlled better than it's controlled at the moment. So I think for me, when, you know, people said to me afterwards, well, it's a very long document. And the way of spinning that around is say, yeah, because it reflects just how much we do know now about this condition, which makes it even more frustrating how, how little impact there has been over the last 10 years or so in improving blood pressure control rates. That's the area we've now got to focus. On that note, it's it's a real delight, and I think people who view this will also share my excitement that it's been a, an enjoyable but very informative session. Thank you both for allocating time and, and swap mail. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you both. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.